the probably legendary Lucius Siccius Dentatus, either born with teeth or snaggletoothed, was supposedly active during the early to mid 5th century BC. Dionysius of Halicarnassus has him boast of single handedly saving his legion twice, rising to Primi Pilus, senior centurion, and earning some 45 scars and many crowns, medals, and torques. After 40 years of service, he was supposedly murdered in 450 BC for opposing the aristocratic decemvirs under Appius Claudius. The father of Roman poetry served as a centurion during the Second Punic War. He had this to say about wartime. When news of battle is proclaimed, away from view is wisdom thrust. With violence is action done. Scorned is the speaker of good counsel. Dear is the rude warrior. Not with learned speeches do men strive, but with evil speaking they fall foul of one another, brewing unfriendliness. They rush to make joint seizure. Not by law, rather by the sword, do they seek a due return and aim at the first place and move on with pack and press. Polybius, writing in the late 2nd century BC, describes the ideal Roman centurion this way. Not to be impetuous and daring as to be natural leaders of a steady and calm spirit. Not to be men who will initiate attacks and open the battle, but men who will hold their ground in a bad situation and when hard pressed, and be ready to die at their posts. Centurions might also fill less savory roles off the battlefield. In 82 BC, Sulla began his prescriptions, putting up a list of named death warrants for the public to see and carry out, revenge against his opponents in the civil war. One Fufidius of Primipilus not only posted the prescription list personally, but given his rapid career advances under Sulla and Sallust's harsh condemnation of him, probably oversaw many of the murders himself, or even carried them out with his own hands. Pullo was one of Caesar's centurions during the Gallic campaign. Caesar writes of one episode involving Pullo and his rival Vorinus. When the fight was going on most vigorously before the fortifications, Pullo says, Why do you hesitate, Vorinus? Or what better opportunity of signalizing your valor do you seek? This very day shall decide our disputes. When he had uttered these words, he proceeds beyond the fortifications and rushes on that part of the enemy which appeared the thickest. Nor does Vorinus remain within the rampart, but respecting the high opinion of all, follows close after. Pullo throws his javelin at the enemy and pierces one of the multitude who was running up, and while the latter was wounded and slain, the enemy cover him with their shields and all throw their weapons at the other and afford him no opportunity of retreating. The shield of Pullo is pierced and a javelin is fastened in his belt. This circumstance turns aside his scabbard and obstructs his right hand when attempting to draw his sword. The enemy crowd around him when thus embarrassed. His rival runs up to him and supports him in this emergency, and both having slain a great number, retreat into the fortification amid the highest applause. The infamous Lucilius was a fearsome disciplinarian serving in the Pannonian legions who seemed to enjoy beating his soldiers with his vitus, the vine staff associated with centurions. Tacitus claims that the beatings were so savage and so often that Lucilius earned the nickname Cato Altera, which means fetch me another, after his habit of breaking his vitus on his soldiers' backs. He was lynched by Pannonian mutineers in AD 14.
two centurions mentioned in the New Testament hint at a neglected aspect of the centurion's role in the early 1st century AD, that of community liaison. The anonymous centurion in Luke and Cornelius in Acts seem to offer patronage and civic support to local Jewish authorities, particularly important in restive Judea. This is corroborated by Egyptian papyri indicating that centurions stationed in Egypt might even judge minor court cases. The Praetorian Guard is often associated with treachery, and its betrayal of the Emperor Galba only seems to confirm this reputation. But according to Plutarch, a centurion in the Guard, one Sempronius Densus, fought alone to the death to protect Galba from his fellow guardsmen. No one tried to defend the Emperor except one man, and he was the only one who was worthy of the Roman Empire. Sempronius Densus, a centurion, and though he had received no special favors from Galba, yet in defense of honor and the law, he took his stand in front of the litter. And first lifting up the staff with which centurions punish soldiers deserving of blows, he cried out to the assailants and ordered them to spare the emperor. Then, as they came to close quarters with him, he drew his sword and fought them off a long time until he fell with a wound in the groin. Sometimes war is glory and honor, and sometimes it's just getting the job done. Josephus describes one episode in the Jewish war like this. A Jewish fighter named Jonathan uttered many other insolent things to the Romans and challenged the best of them all to single combat. But many of those that stood there in the army were afraid of him. And so a cavalryman named Pudens took up Jonathan's challenge but was killed in the ensuing duel. Jonathan brandished his sword bloody as it was, and shook his shield with his left hand, and made many acclamations to the Roman army, and insulted over the dead man, and jested upon the Romans. Till at length, one Priscus, a centurion, shot a dart at him as he was leaping, and playing the fool with himself, and thereby pierced him through. So Jonathan grew giddy by the pain of his wounds, and fell down upon the body of his adversary. Castus was a man of many identities. A centurion of the 3rd, 6th, 2nd, and 5th legions, and Primipilus of the latter, Dux, Praepositus, possibly one of two camp prefects, and finally, after retirement from the army, Procurator of Liburnia. What are we to make of him? Was he a brave defender of the empire sent to trouble spots wherever needed? A war junkie who followed wherever the action was? A ruthless careerist who chased the best opportunities? Maybe even a bit of a schlub in his early army days, given his legion hopping? His distinguished military career, his family name, and his command in Britain might have even birthed the legend of King Arthur, although this theory is rejected by most scholars. In any case, he seems to have died fulfilled, given the illustrious career chiseled on his memorial in today's Potstrana. Centurions could rise from the rank and file, or be appointed directly from among the civilians. Either way, a newly minted centurion had to be approved by the emperor himself, something in fact quite doable, according to some scholars. And sometimes the politics of promotion could turn deadly. The emperor Caracalla, at least according to Cassius Dio, seemed to be rather unwise in his appointments. He would promote willy-nilly his Scythian and German bodyguards some of them even slaves, to the rank of centurion, while ignoring formal promotion requests from career soldiers such as Martialis. The latter, furious at being passed up, ended up stabbing the emperor to death in AD 217. A generation after Martialis, emperors lived or died by the approval of their army officers, as the Roman Empire now entered the third century crisis. Marcellus of Tangier was, according to Christian tradition, a centurion stationed in Tingis during the late 3rd century, martyred for his Christian faith in AD 289 
for refusing to sacrifice to the Emperor Maximian as part of the imperial birthday celebrations. One of his final acts was to defiantly throw down his belt, sword, and vitis. Though Maximian probably didn't persecute the Christians particularly fiercely, there was probably a purge of Christians for the Roman military in the final decades of the 3rd century. The alleged execution of a number of Egyptian Christian troops in AD 286, also known as the martyrdom of the Theban legion, may have been part of this purge. The centurion had seen a lot of change over the course of 400 years. Even now, he still commanded a hundred men and fought alongside them, and he still carried his vitis, though 4th century mosaics show the vitis with a mace-like head, but he was increasingly called Centenarius instead of centurion. He seems to have lost the distinctive Christa transversa, and he now found himself jostling elbow to elbow with an array of other middling military ranks. What it meant to be a centurion in the 1st and 2nd centuries, not only military officer, but also community liaison, local judge, kingmaker, or just to climb the political ladder, was a thing of the past by the 4th century. The Centenarius was increasingly just another cog in the vast military bureaucratic machine of the late Roman Empire. By this period, as Greek increasingly overtook Latin, an officer of 100 men was increasingly referred to as Hecatontarch. Below him was the Decarch, commander of 10, and below that the Pentarch, leader of 5. Maurice's Strategicon recommends that each cavalryman should have the equipment corresponding to his rank and pay, and this be especially the case when it came to the officers, including the Hecatontarchs. It's a slightly cryptic phrase, but given Maurice's claim that the more handsome the soldier in his armament, the more confidence he gains in himself, and the more fear he inspires in the enemy, it seems that at the very least, the Hecatontarch was still expected to look and play the part of a disciplined professional officer. And here is our coda. Well into the Byzantine period, we still have officers of a hundred infantrymen called Hecatontarchs. In his Praecepta Militaria, Emperor Nikephoros Phokas describes an army of a thousand men, with seven lines of heavy spearmen, each a hundred men wide. In the middle of each line stood the Hecatontarch, with two deputies, Pentacontarchs, standing to the leftmost and rightmost of each line. Little else is said about the Hecatontarch's role apart from general army camp management. Let us leave the centurion there, then. Some 1300 years after Lucius Siccius Dentatus, still fighting alongside 100 men. <laughs>